afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. I'm Tom Wheeler, a visiting fellow here at the Berkman Institution. Um, and uh, one piece of housekeeping before we get going, um, that is that the last 15 minutes of this session will be questions from the floor and from the audience, We or, and from the uh, virtual audience. Uh, we have uh, apparently like 500 or so people out there, so in, in virtual video land uh, joining us. But we are here today at what can only be described as an historic moment um, in the history of this issue of how do we deal with the safety of online content. Uh, and we're lucky enough to be joined by two of the leading experts in the field. One who helped wake all of us up with her 2021 whistleblower exposés of what was going on inside Facebook. And one, a regulator who is actually having to tackle the problems um, in the real world um, uh, with regulatory authority. So let me introduce formally um, Dame Melanie Dawes, who is the chief executive of the Office of Communications um, in the UK government. Um, Ofcom is the closest thing that we have in our country would be the FCC. Um, and she has been given the incredible responsibility of moving beyond the already significant challenges that she had, regulating what goes on uh, over, uh, over networks and broadcasters and, and things like this, to being given by the parliament of the UK responsibility for their new Online Safety Act. Mm -hmm. um, and Francis Hogan, who helped introduce us to the realities of what goes on behind the screen <clears throat> uh, that creates all of these challenges. Uh, it was her 2021 20, testimony that uh, at both the United States Congress and the UK Parliament, mm -hmm. right, that got this whole thing um, rolling. Um, I'm proud to say that uh, Francis and I served together on the Council for Responsible Social Media um, and uh, and I also, you know, want to make sure that everybody understands she's just come back from Toronto where mm -hmm. she received a book award for her book, The Power of One, mm -hmm. which tells the story of her trip um, and the experience that she had being the Facebook whistleblower. So, clearly we got the right people. <laughs> clearly we got a hot topic. But I said that we were here at a unique time in history to talk about this. And let me, let me support that for a second. On October 26th, the UK Law Online Safety Act became law with the royal assent. And less than two weeks later, Melanie Dawes and Ofcom produced an 1,800-page implementation of that law. We're going to talk about how she pulled that off in record time. <laughs> but interestingly enough, two days before the Online Safety Act became law, 42 mm -hmm. state attorneys general here in separate actions, but 33 of them in the, in the principal action, filed suit against Meta and what they called a, quote, scheme to exploit young users for profit. Mm -hmm. That one should mention 
resulted from an investigation began in 2021, thanks to the lady sitting at the end. And then this month, November 14th, a federal judge rejected Meta's efforts to dismiss suits, hundreds of suits, that have been brought by parents and school boards around the country about content. And Monday of this week, a federal court rejected Meta's effort to block the Federal Trade Commission's action relative to their investigation of uh, of whether Meta is appropriately using the information that is gathered from under 18 Mm. users. So truly, you know, when I say we're here at a unique time, at a special time, at a consequential time, that is not an exaggeration. And we have two consequential people with us. So Melanie Dawes, (laughs) Dame Melanie, um, give us an oversight, overview of what you've done the pr- and, and the process that you utilized to get there and the insights you gathered during that mm-hmm. process. Mm-hmm. That, that's all we want to know, and you've got five minutes I've to discuss it. I've got a few it. minutes. <clears throat> well, look, thank you, Tom. And can I just say thank you to you and Brookings for hosting us this afternoon. Um, thank you to everyone online for joining us as well. Um, you've been a friend to the UK and to Ofcom for many years in your role at the FCC, and it's good to be moving into new topics. Um, So um, let me just say a little bit about what our new laws do and what our parliament has intended here. Um, Essentially, what the Online Safety Act does, and as you say, it's five weeks old today, it's still a very new piece of law, it places a duty of care on companies that offer user-to-user services or search services to British citizens. So that's pretty much all of the large companies that we will be familiar with, but also quite a large number of smaller ones as well. We think at least 100,000 companies are in scope, no matter where they're domiciled. Um, And to discharge that duty of care, uh, they have to put in place systems and processes. That's really important. It's not about taking down content or having rules about what speech can or can't stay on the internet. It's about having effective systems and processes to address various harms that our parliament has set out. And those harms fall essentially into two broad buckets. The first is illegal harms, and that's what we came straight out of the blocks on uh, two weeks after the bill was enacted. And that's things like the exchange of child sexual abuse material and images. It's child grooming online. Uh, Problems, I'm afraid, both of them that are massively increasing still and are turbocharged further by generative AI, I think, as well. It's also fraud and terror and illegal hate and incitement. Uh, so it's, it's stuff that's just illegal, actually, which all platforms these days have policies on. But what we're asking them to do is things which we don't think are being done consistently across the, the industry, which I'll come on to in just a moment. That's the first bucket, illegal harms online, stuff that's illegal offline as well. And then the second bucket of harms is around protecting children. So this is about acknowledging that our kids will be online. They live their lives online. That's not going to change. We shouldn't want it to change, really. It's the life as we, it's life now as we know it. But the experience for 13 to 18 year olds should be appropriate to their age. And that means not casual ability to find pornography online, but and also um, that the experience that the algorithms serve up is appropriate and not intense, for example, on things like suicide and self-harm material, which is a particular priority area for our parliament. So those are the two broad areas um, of the act. There are a few more things, but those are the two main things. And we, t- three weeks ago, we set out our blueprint for what we're expecting. And first, we want to see better governance. We want to see accountability. We ask for a named accountable officer in every company, large or small. If you're a big company, we're going to be looking for uh, a lot more than that. We're going to be looking for proper internal audit uh, processes. We're going to be looking for performance metrics to account for safety for the first time. Ultimately, I want engineering teams to be thinking about safety and not just the commercial bottom lines uh, that they're incentivized to at at the moment. The second thing we ask for is risk assessment. We have produced, and one of the reasons it's a very long document that we published, 
a very comprehensive assessment of the causes and impacts of harms for UK adults and children. And it's the same harms that your citizens are concerned about here in the US as well. A huge a actual real understanding amongst the British public that action on regulation is now needed. But we've set out that analysis. And, you know, a lot of what we find is not about, again, particular content. Sometimes it is content, but it's actually also functionalities. Mm. It's about whether or not children can be found easily by adults who don't know them on the internet. It's about recognizing that things like encryption can create extra risk. It's, about, it's actually about design. It's about having decent user complaints mechanisms, using trusted flaggers who have expertise in areas like domestic abuse material or terror or fraud. So it's about that kind of design. You know, the sort of risk assessment requires them to look at their service, look at our risk assessment, and then think about where their particular risks may be and then the third thing we need is mitigations. So we've set out quite a comprehensive list of the things that we believe work. And that comes on to your question. And my final point is kind of how have we managed to do this so quickly? We've been working for three years now on this at Ofcom. Our parliament granted us um, funding. We will be funded by the industry longer term through a fee regime. We're independent of our government. We are a non-political body from top to bottom. But um, we have been funded by our government to get ready. We've assembled a team of more than 350 people, some of whom are here today, with expertise in policy, legal, economics, data, people who've worked in the industry and some of the companies concerned, people who really understand kind of um, uh, rights um, and child protection issues, people who've come from a law enforcement background. And that team is on a mission. Um, but we are also in Ofcom, we're all about evidence. We can't do anything as a civil regulator unless we can stack up the case in court. So how have we done this? We've gone out and engaged with the industry, with many experts, including in this city, actually, and elsewhere across the US, to draw out what we know works, and that's what's in our codes. In a sense, what we're saying to the industry is, this is stuff that you are using and making work in some places. Here it is. Let's now make this a proper standard across the whole industry so that we can achieve some progress. So we've just started. Um, we're quite excited, I will grant you that, um, and really glad to be here. And to... No, you haven't just started. Well, I mean, we I, haven't we, just we were, started, so but we've just got our powers. <laughs> I, I, I met with Melanie eight or nine months ago in London, and she had 250 people yeah. at work then. She's got more than 350 going now. I mean, this has been a... It's a proper, properly resourced. A endeavor. serious it is. exercise. There is, so and and so, Francis. Mm. Mm. There is nobody in the world sitting in a regulatory position that mm. has put more analysis and more thought into this issue than Melanie Dawes and her team. One hundred percent. How do we take that? learning mm. and make it relevant here in the United States. You have been doing such a superb job of shaking the trees and waking everybody up. How do we move forward in the United States and what are the threats and mitigation strategies for doing that? So my, one of probably my biggest issue since I came forward so this has started with my initial Senate testimony and carries on to today, is trying to introduce the idea that we have been told over and over again by the big social media companies, by Google, that there is only one tool in our tool chest in terms of keeping us safe. That's content moderation, censorship. So they say, oh, those, those harms are so bad. We're so sorry. But like, we have a choice to make. Like, Do you want free speech or do you want safety? And the reality of these systems is it's, there are, there's, it's not like we have one magic bullet and we have to choose whether or not we use it. It's that every single online harm has an entire life cycle. So if you're in cybersecurity or in, in defense, you probably know this is like a kill chain. And there's a lot of different steps in how that harm comes to be. You know, someone creates the content. They have a motivation for it. They have an opportunity to spread it. They, it goes into the system. The system either knows or doesn't know about the content. It distributes in certain ways. People have different ways of influencing it. There's different ways that people can receive it. You can intervene at lots of different stops and steps in that, in that process. And one of the things I was really grateful to the, the new Facebook whistleblower, Arturo Behar, um, who testified for the Senate a couple of weeks ago, was he talked to me about this idea. 
But there's a lot of different places in that, in that process where you can begin making a difference. And so uh, one of the big things that I've been trying to, to have people begin opening up about is the idea that we have lots of tools in our tool, tool chest. And when we focus on content moderation, we by definition choose to leave behind anyone in the world that doesn't speak one of the largest languages. So there's four to 5,000 languages in the world. Um, even dialectical differences get left behind because AI is not smart. Now, these are really hard problems. Um, uh, computer, the computers don't understand subtlety, nuance, meaning. And that when we only focus on is this idea good or bad, you know, I, I'm a fellow at, Mon at McGill in Montreal, we leave behind, say, French Canadians. Because French Canadians don't speak Parisian French. And the security systems are all written for that kind of French. You know, there's hundreds of millions of other French speakers who don't speak European French. They get left behind. So instead, we need to take a systems approach, kind of like what the UK has taken. They said, hey, you can step in here and here and here and here. And even when you do step in at this point in the chain, you don't have to do one thing. You can do all these different things. And I'll give you one more example of why like the big part that I've been rooted in in terms of how do we move this conversation forward is uh, you know, when it comes to things like kids, the most important thing is to keep under 13-year-olds off these platforms. And, and one of the questions I was going to ask you is you said 13 to 18-year-olds. Mm. What, how does the new rule deal with under 13-year-olds? Well, I mean, they're not supposed to be online. Okay, and most terms and conditions okay, prevent it. So I was kind of saying that yeah. because that's the kind of... It'd be that's amazing it's supposed, supposed to be. be. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. you know, in the UK, we know that... Uh, I forget the numbers exactly, but it's like, you know, approaching 50% of <clears throat> primary school age kids are on, say, TikTok. One of the shocking <clears throat> things that came out of the unredacted AG complaint just in the last week was that Facebook was actually tracking market pe pe penetration for 10 to 13 year olds. Mm -hmm. They were like, how many 10 to 13 year olds do we have on these platforms? While they were going in front of the Senate and saying, when we find out about an under 13 year old, we take them down. Right, so how those both through. Um, but the, uh, so, Part of the reason that conversation doesn't move forward is big tech has been telling us we would love to t keep under 13-year-olds off these platforms, but then we'd have to check IDs, right? And I, I hear this talking point so pronouncedly that I watched a panel just a month ago. It was the day before the AG lawsuit came out at uh, an Issue 1 event, and the head of the American Psychological Association was up on stage on a panel, and he said very definitively, the APA does not support age gaining social media because we believe the harms of having a national database of IDs is far worse than the harms of social media to kids. And I, I walked up to him afterwards and I went, how would, it, how would your opinion change if you knew there were 10 or 15 different ways to find kids under the age of 13? You know, everything from kids say they're a fourth grader to kids report each other to punish each other. Uh, or even their parents report them. One of the things that came out of the AG lawsuit this week was there was, an, there was a, a child whose mother reported their four Instagram accounts and kept emailing in and being like, why have these not been shut down yet? I told you, I've given you ID, I've given you documentation that this is my child. Why aren't these accounts shut down? And it's because Facebook intentionally understaffed the people who are responsible for verifying those claims. Like, she was sitting in a queue with two and a half to three million other children. So it didn't matter that the, her mother had reported her. They weren't gonna get to them for another year or two. So all of these things, we have a lot of tools. We, ha we could have a much more res robust, participatory, democratic conversation about how do we want these spaces to work. But we only get to do that if we begin to all get to sit around a table and see the same menu. And so a big part of what I've been working on for the last year with our new nonprofit, Beyond the Screen, because we are limited right now to what we see on our screens, is trying to get an open source, collaborative standard of care out in the world where the way we get to the point where we can have the sophistication to have a regulator step in and say, okay, we're gonna codify this, is we need to have ways to have lots of technologists, lots of people who are tracking social problems, be able to surface their concerns and surface ways of solving those problems so that people like Mel Melanie can come in there and say, hey, let's, val let's, let's get, validate things, let's at least say this is the floor. The floor is gonna move up because we have new tools. And so I think there's a wonderful synthesis of like how do we bring together different uh, forms of knowledge, how do we bring home from, together different stakeholders, and then how do we codify those new norms into laws and practices? So let's pick up on that. Sure. That, that um, I know from our previous discussions that you've tended more towards 
how do we have marketplace solutions and how do we have technology-based solutions mm. rather than regulatory solutions, mm -hmm. if you will. One of the things that interests me about what you've done, Melanie, is, is that you're not taking the traditional micromanaging regulatory approach mm. to things, but rather saying, well, I won't explain it, you explain it, about, about, what, about moving, how you move from specific judgments about content, specific, specific items of content, to the whole question of creating the procedures to deal so you don't have to get to that point. Mm. So look, there, you're right. I mean, we're not saying here is a rule, <coughs> you must follow it, where we have an expectation of systems and processes and activities that need to be, do we need to take place. What, why is that? Well, some of it starts with the UK regulatory tradition, um, which is fundamentally, we believe in markets, and we believe that private sector actions are often going to be the right way to solve some of these problems. But in areas like safety, where there's public policy outcomes that need to be achieved, you know, sometimes you need to, as here, actually intervene to set a level playing field. If you get that right, it improves the competitive environment. It allows smaller companies to come in because they know the rules and things are clearer than they were before. But we start with the presumption that actually, you know, the market is a great place to start, really. But why have we not been more prescriptive here? Well, it's for a number of reasons. One is that we are all playing catch up here, frankly. Mm -hmm. And because there's been no regulation and very little transparency, really, um, the level of knowledge that we will have, the understanding of how do you measure these things? How do you measure, for example, a teenager's individual social media feed and the extent to which they have suicide and self-harm material on it compared to the average amount of that material that is available on one platform. It's the first I care about. That's the impact on the child. The second is just an average. How do we... So, 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 so part of what I'm saying here is that there's been no transparency and relatively little thought to some of these things in a truly holistic pan-industry way that really puts societal interests and consumers' interests and kids' interests and experiences at the centre. Mm. So we have no choice right now but to say, look, you know, this has to be flexible. This has to be a menu of options. But the final thing is, is that, you know, when you're dealing with services like these that are powered by technology, the rate of change is absolutely mm -hmm. enormous, which is why I think what Francis is saying about developing a bit of a framework here that says here is the journey, the end-to-end -end journey of harm, which is what we're trying to do in the UK, because you're absolutely right. There's so many things which are not about the content, they're about interrupting the perpetrator much further along. Or, or For example, stopping, just stopping kids' yeah. education, yeah. just stopping kids from being able to be found by adults they totally. don't know, which is one of the measures we've proposed to tackle child grooming. So if we can get that framework going, then I think you're absolutely right. What Ofcom can then do is build on that and go, OK, this now has enough evidence behind it. We can stack up a legal case that it's proportionate, that it's privacy preserving, that it's pro-innovation, it's pro-freedom of speech, all, by the way, things that are in our law that we're required to follow. And then we can we can codify some things. From the UK yeah, go for it. I want to I want to build on that that layer one, which is I think when we talk about like how does the free market solve problems, we should ask why hasn't the free market gone to solve these problems yet? <clears throat> and one of the things that I always um, so like I have a Harvard MBA. I'm married to a serial entrepreneur. I believe in the power of innovation. Right. Um, uh, when we look at the variety of social media platforms that have come around. Today, because we don't have legally mandated transparency, when I'm consp con comparing my platform to yours, all I have to go off of is marketing messages, right? Which, which company has a better marketing team? Versus, say, let's look at computer hardware. When it comes to things like the iPhone, uh, go, go search for Apple whistleblower. Like, you type Apple whistleblower into Google, you get something from, like, 2017. It's like, where are the, where are the Apple whistleblowers? And part of that is when we talk about hardware, you can buy that phone and take it apart. You can buy that phone and run performance tests on it. Within hours of a new iPhone coming out, there are videos of people taking those iPhones apart and confirming that the chips that Apple said are in there are in there, or running benchmarks and saying, yes, it can do these tasks. So there's very little incentive to lie. The thing that I'm so excited about, uh, you guys coming into your powers, is uh, they can now formally request data they can start saying standards 
if you're a social platform, you need to publish the following data so that <clears throat> when someone asks, what should my kids be using? You know, I'm really worried about them using it addictively. You know, what if you had data saying what fraction of kids on each of these platforms said, I regret my usage, or I feel compulsive when I use this? Or what if you knew how many kids were on at 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3 a.m.? Because some platforms have bigger problems than others. And so saying we can't have competition without having a minimum amount of like rules of the road, like saying you have to actually let us ask questions and get answers. That's how we make a space where innovation can begin solving these problems. So you talked about the companies could have done something. Mm -hmm. um, they've made the rules, okay? We now see big advertising campaigns. Mm. From a certain party. From a certain party. Yeah. That are, um, that are saying, well, um, really this is the App Store problem. That, or that, Congress's problem. That, well, this, oh, yeah. for, this is the App Store <laughs> problem, that if, if, if the App Stores were forced to make the age verification, yeah. then, then we wouldn't have any problems. Or, as you say, no, this is only Congress can solve this. You know, we've been around for two decades now refining this process, but it's that problem over there or only Congress can solve it, and we can't. Two questions. One, how does your model blow the whistle on that? And two, how does that fit with the kind of concept you were just discussing? So on that, do you mean how does it blow the whistle on that specific example? Of yeah, like, why don't we use the app stores to age verify? Um, this, you know, somebody. Yeah, yeah. Or, the, or, the, or the idea that they can't do anything. Yeah. Right. Like if these are blog posts from Facebook well, saying like, we need one of these two actors to act. So um, the new law in the UK places a responsibility on social media platforms to operate a duty of care. And that will include understanding who your under 18 users and customers mm -hmm. are. Um, and that will require some form of age verification at age 18, either at sign up um, or more regularly, depending on the way the service is configured. And I would answer that point, and indeed I have answered that point a number of times, as you can imagine, <laughs> by saying that, look, if there's a device side kind of system here, and a relationship that can be struck between a social media company and Apple or others to create that link in a way that's privacy pr preserving and you know really effective um, and makes sense to the user, then absolutely great. I'm all in favor of solutions that work. But what will not happen is that the responsibility for ensuring that people who are on your app are of the age you want them to be and that you're serving them up the service that's appropriate for their age, that responsibility is with the social media company and it can't be moved to another part of the ecosystem, even if you can use another part of the ecosystem to give you the assurance you need to yep. fulfill your responsibilities. So that's how our law works. Let's get the innovation, let's get the partnerships, mm -hmm. you know, but the responsibility is clear. It's on the social media company. I, I think it's also, you know, when, when, when Tom mentioned... They put out an 1800 page document saying, like, hey, here's a bunch of things that work. Or, or they're going to have an age assurance document. Okay, this is next this week. Yeah, we have one on. Yeah, we can tell you about that in a moment. Yeah. No, it's, um, it's good. Yeah. It's a little Christmas um, present for um, everybody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, when, when they release these things and say, hey, we talked to a whole bunch of people, you know, there's a bunch of options. At a minimum, you know, these six, these eight, these follow the principles of being free speech protecting, privacy protecting, blah, 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 blah. You know, they're implicitly saying, you've had this ability for years. You've chosen not to use it. And for context, um, given you guys are in DC, I'm sure you've seen the ads in elevators before. There were a lot of them when I, when I came forward. Um, they used to have these things saying, it's time to regulate social media. Like that's all the ads would say, it's time to regulate social media. And you'd ask Meta, Facebook, you'd say, okay, what should we do? And they'd be like, oh, we don't know. Why don't you propose something and then we'll give you feedback. Um, but the thing that's changed in the last two weeks is I have never, ever, ever seen before Meta make any proactive declaration saying we need Congress to act. There needs to be a law that does ABC. Never seen it before. 
And they put out that blog post on their official blog a couple weeks ago. And so I think this is a, a, a kind of a, a, a initial, you know, a little bit of blood in the water, is the way usually big class action settlements by the AGs work is they get settled. Like the companies are not full, they, they don't bring lawsuits like this unless the evidence is overwhelming. The companies look at it and they're like, we don't want to have a trial because they'll show, make it look, look even worse, we're going to settle. And I'm guessing they're scared that they're going to be the only company out there that is going to block under 16 year olds. And then suddenly TikTok, if, unless TikTok gets a lawsuit too, or other <coughs> places, people are going to migrate there. And so what I'm quite excited about is the idea that, um, one, action seems to be near. But the thing that I'm hoping we can build more towards the direction of is this is a very top-down action. So part of why I came forward was I did not believe kind of the top-down technocratic approach inside of Facebook gave us good results. Right? It's Mark and Mark's buddies rule the social media world for us. There's like billions of people who it is the internet for in places like African countries, Southeast Asia. To get no safety systems, no investment, stuff goes off the rails. How can we begin having a bottoms up conversation about what problems we care about? Right? If you go and talk to principals right now, they say things like, you know, my prin the principal of my high school, I once spoke there and he said, I'm so glad you came, Francis. Uh, there is an anonymous, he said, uh, the number one thing I spend discipline time on is Instagram. And my, like, psh, like I, I felt very old in that moment. Um, I was like, how can, you, how can that be true? Like, how can the top thing you spend disciplinary time on be Instagram? And he's like, well, there's an anonymous fight club in our school that has an Instagram account, and I don't know who owns it, and um, kids are picking fights with each other and filming them. And the victims are so embarrassed, they don't come forward. So we're like looking at the videos, trying to figure out who the kids are, trying to track them down, trying to punish them, trying to keep it from happening again. And I've gone to Instagram over and over and over again and said, you are actively causing children to go to the hospital. <laughs> Could you please take this account down? And they won't. And they only took it down after I started using it as an example in interviews. Melanie. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to this sense of kind of why we are where we are. I mean, um, I think many in the industry have been trying to introduce change here. And actually, one of the reasons why Ofcom's been able to come out with codes with quite a lot of mitigations set out is because there has been quite a lot of action. Mm -hmm. So we have, for example, CSAM hash matching has been around for a while, mm -hmm. come out of the industry through photo DNA. Um, similarly, you know, content moderation is in place on, you know, all of the big services. So it's not that nothing has happened. Um, and also, I think a lot of the technology solutions are coming on stream now, particularly on something like age estimation, which is actually becoming usable uh, as technology is making it so over the last year or so. It's moving quite fast. So that's one of the reasons why I think we are at a really quite an exciting moment. Some of the solutions that are coming on stream are, I think, you know, really quite exciting. And you know, I think we now have a critical mass of evidence of solutions that can work. But we do also, of course, have a critical mass of evidence of why this is so necessary. Uh, it's taken a while. But I think, you know, I, I, I just want to paint a picture, I think, of a, that there has been progress here. It's just that I think only with regulation do you get consistency and transparency and real help for the consumer in navigating uh, I, a very complicated universe. I want to toot your horn on more. So part of why I'm so excited about the UK stepping in is... Uh, when Facebook brags about their children's safety efforts, uh, they name a bunch of things, almost all of which came, got launched on the same day, which is the day the UK passed the uh, age-appropriate design code back in 2021. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one of these things where when we come in and say all companies need to do a certain level of care, there stops being the situation <coughs> where the first mover gets punished. Like The reason why Facebook was pushing exactly. for a law is they're like, oh, if we lose under 16-year-olds, we lose the entire future. That's why they haven't acted in the past, because there were real growth implications of doing the right thing. Yeah. When you say, no, 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 at a minimum, you're going to publish this amount of data so everyone knows that you're cheating. Um, but second, you say, you know, there's a lot of really conscientious, smart people who do want to do the right thing in each of these companies. And unless you have consistent standards, they don't get to act and do the right thing. Okay, let's go up for a second. Let's go up to 30,000 feet here for a second. We've been spending the first half hour here talking about children, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. obviously incredibly important. 
But the same structure that exploits these kids promotes fraud, yep. promotes terror, destabilizes democracies, causes insurrections. How are you dealing with that, Melody? I'm dealing with that. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, read the summary of the 1800-page document. There is, by the way, a very, a very good 35-page summary. It's, it's, it's very good. It's superb. If we'd only done something that good at the, the FCC. The, the long version's good too, but the short version is even better, I, I would argue. Um, so how do we deal with those things? You're absolutely right. Well, look, <clears throat> some, of, some of the things that you need are actually you know, common to every harm. So some of the things I was saying about governance and risk assessment, which is fundamentally in both those, it's about culture. It's about taking it seriously, doing the work. It doesn't matter what your har harm you're talking about. If those things are in place, goodness me, I'm going to be pleased. Um, that's the, the most important starting point. Um, clearly, content moderation. I mean, it's far from the only tool, but it's a very important tool when you're looking for certain types of illegal content, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, things like fraud, um, again, without going into the detail, um, in areas like that, um, things like trusted flagger schemes we're recommending for the largest platforms, because often it's the law enforcement agencies or the tax authorities who know the detail of a piece of content or a particular account that might be fraudulent. And so you put in place the channel into the industry, require the biggest companies to engage with that channel. And actually it's easier for the company because they know what the, where the problem areas are. They've got assurance that the expertise is being brought to bear and they can then act more quickly. So we've got kind of multiple different tools here and some of them are in co good content moderation covers a lot of bases mm -hmm. but some are very specific to particular types of harm does that give you a bit of a bit of a flavor i'm, I'm going to come back to you but yes age verification is another clearly critical one yeah. for, for young people but we've moved away from that i think the other thing too is um so one of the things that i really enjoyed out of uh, arturo behar's senate testimony was he talked about the difference of do you grade the performance of a platform based on looking at the bad content or do you ask the people on the platform, have you experienced these kinds of, of crimes, mm -hmm. right? So if you are defrauded or someone extorts you or someone um, uh, uh, takes your image, so for example, uh, uh, one of the things I was shocked by was, I can't remember which country it was. There was a country where there's, I think maybe in Australia, where there was a big problem with people running ads with elected officials' faces saying that they endorsed things. Right? So, like, there was, like, an economic fraud where it was, like, you know, if you invest in this thing, you're going to make a lot of money. And it's, like, you know, an elected official's face, like, on, on these ads. And they were just not getting taken down. You know, it's kind of that level of, of lack of, 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 of care. Um, if you start requiring them to report those numbers and you put them publicly, the numbers go down. Right? If you ask people, like, have you had crimes, if, uh, uh, if people knew these things were not, uh, you know, 0 .005 or whatever it is that Facebook says they're happening, but like 1%, 2%, 5% of people, or, you know, 5 or 10% of people over the age of 65, because that's a lot of the people who get targeted by e-crime, suddenly you can build social pressure. And I want to really emphasize the non-governmental ways that we char change problems like right now, we don't get to do boycott, advertiser boycotts. We don't get to do divestment campaigns. We don't get to do protests. There's a bunch of different things that we don't get to do because we don't have the data other than Facebook's assurance that everything is fine. And it's very hard to uh, mobilize that larger ecosystem of accountability or, co or collaboration if the platforms are not required to share data that would actually say, hey, I need help. Okay, so there are two th two. Mm -hmm. legs on this I guess it's not a stool if you got two legs but but there are two legs on this uh, uh, a ladder maybe it's a ladder uh, the ladder yeah. whatever it is thank you for your help <laughs> that I keep hearing from you transparency 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 we got to have the information okay and and Melanie then saying and based on that information we want to require the companies to do that which they say they could do but haven't done yet, which is a behavioral code, if you will. Is that, am I? 
No, you're not, you're not buying that. Well, I think, I yeah. think transparency is a really important part of yeah. what we're arguing for as well, right. and is, is indeed in our, particularly for the biggest platforms, right. I didn't mention this, but there are transparency requirements on how they deal with things like hate and disinformation. There's no requirements to have a standard, but there is a requirement to follow the standard that you have set in your own terms and conditions for the biggest platforms. So that's, transparency is incredibly important, and I don't think you can really regulate without it. And we publish, right. constantly yeah. publishing right. stuff in Ofcom, um, it's a really important part of any regulator's kind of toolkit. But I'm, I'm saying governance, risk assessment, and mitigation. So maybe it's a four-legged stool. I'll, I'll give you an example. It's like, let's talk about terrorism for a quick second. So one approach on terrorism, which is kind of the thing we've been told, is like if you put up terrorist content, you know, the company needs to be able to detect it, take it down. Or if someone reports terrorism content, you need to take it down. Uh, a thing that they know inside of Facebook, though they don't fund it well enough inside of Facebook, is you can actually see the terrorist network operating, right? Um, right now, there is no requirements that they disclose how many people are um, actually working on those teams. They're not required to actually collaborate with people who could help them identify or contextualize those groups. There's no trusted flagger requirements mm-hmm. where it's like, oh, you need to have relationships with the people who know what's going on on the ground. And so I think it's one of these things where it's, it's transparency allows us to see are there problems, but I think one thing that I'm quite excited about Ofcom is it says, hey, like, you need to tell us what your mitigation strategy is. And we get to give you feedback saying you could try harder. And you need to actually accept help. And right now, because there is no um, uh, market incentive to do a good job in these kind of, I call them social balance sheet issues. You know, you can take from the social balance sheet and make your economic balance sheet look better. That's why Elon fired tons of people. That's why Mark said Elon was right. He ripped the Band-Aid off. And so Mark fired 20,000 people who worked on safety. It's because there's no immediate economic incentive to do a good job. When you start saying there's a floor, right? Like you, you have to engage. You have to, be, you have to talk to us about how you're engaging. And we're going to be able to move forward together. But it's not just about you. It's about us, us all together. Okay. So we've got... This is the five-minute warning for everybody here who's got, who's got questions. We're, we're five minutes away from questions. But I want to ask you, before mm-hmm. we get there, what's next? Mm-hmm. What's next? So um, we published our first consultation on illegal harms. The next one is out next week, um, which is about appropriate, highly effective, which is what our law says, age assurance for commercial pornography sites, And that'll be a menu of options we think works and some things we don't think work, like just asking people what their age is. That gives no assurance at all, in our opinion. Um, And then we will follow that up in the spring with further measures to ensure an age-appropriate experience for teens online, effectively. Hmm. Um, But what we're also doing is engaging right now with the largest and some of the small but risky companies Um, to supervise what they're doing already. This is a concept from financial services regulation that we are applying in this new field. So what we're doing is getting alongside those companies now, finding out what they're up to, because we've already set our expectations out on some of the most central stuff, and we kind of want to know what they're going to do about it. Um, We're using our information powers already to get what we need by way of data and intel on on what's going on. So we're kind of gearing up so that once our codes, which need to go through consultation uh, and then need to be laid in our parliament to take legal force, which takes about a year for each of the codes, Uh, Once that happens, then if we need to move into formal compliance and we can fine and sanction and ultimately disrupt businesses if we feel we need to, then we'll be ready to go and move. But I strongly hope that most companies will, as we've found so far, because we were already doing some limited regulation of some companies, that actually people will find that kind of working with us, we're practical people. Um, I don't want to waste my time going through a legal route when I don't need to in the courts and actually, we are prepared to listen and understand. We just need to know that companies are taking this seriously, fulfilling their obligations, and we will work with them to come up with solutions here. But we will, we will take another route if we need to. So when I was over to see you eight or nine months ago, um, I also met with one of the ministers who was responsible in this space. And as I was leaving... I ran into a team from one of the major social media platforms who were the next appointment. Mm -hmm. Okay? How have you been finding the cooperation? 
With the government or no, with the no, social media? No, with social yeah. media. It's two different sets of stakeholders. <laughs> um, so, um, look, we've had some very constructive engagement with the industry. We've done some very deep dive um, work with uh, four or five companies, including some of the big household names, to understand what they do now. I mean, they are all doing stuff. Um, and in some cases, it's quite sophisticated, um, but not very transparent to the public. So we've, been, we've had some good engagement. But what we've also found, and we found this as a regulator, you'll know this, Tom, is that, you know, when you actually have your powers and the rubber really hits the road, the engagement does change. So this has only happened in the last few weeks. Uh, We'll have some companies who go, oh, hang on, really? Really? You can ask us for information and we have to provide it. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Uh, So there will be rubber that hits the road and there will be a a few sort of, you know, burning tyres here and there. But... um, that's the next phase. That's but we have experience of these relationships and how you run them. She, she's being very polite. I want to give you a sense of like how... <laughs> I'm always the, polite. The, <laughs> I, I always try to give people the best... Uh, I always try to interpret the best intentions. But I, I just need to give some examples of how companies interact with people like, like with senior governmental officials. Um, uh, I was told by a senior governmental leader in Canada that they asked a representative for TikTok, how many Canadians have TikTok accounts? And the person laughed at them and said, you'd like to know that, wouldn't you? Right? Like, there is a real weird asymmetry in how these companies are like, well, you, we know you can't get that info, so like, we're not gonna, we, don't have to do, we don't have any laws. And so I'm super intrigued to see, as you say, when the rubber hits the road, how does that relationship change? Because we really have been living in a little bit of a chaotic world and, you know, things will adjust as we have different expectations. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, one of the great things about Brookings is everybody gets a chance to also engage with these two great assets here. I saw your hand first, and then we'll go over here. Yes, sir. Oh, we got a microphone coming up here so that the people online can hear your question. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the past, much has been... Can you identify yourself and then... Uh, The name is Bob Wyman, independent consultant, um, 45, 50 years in the computer industry, Google, Microsoft, places like that. Anyway, um, in the past, much has been said about the impact of algorithmic promotion Mm -hmm. uh, or demotion of content um, and and, and the risk that that causes. That primarily occurs on the main major platforms, Facebook, Twitter, etc., we have a small number of people, merely somewhere between 10 and 20 million people, who are using alternative systems, open source systems, that are based on ActivityPub, things like Mastodon, Pleroma, mm-hmm. now there's Blue Sky, et cetera. Um, and those systems are almost, almost completely reverse chronological order, mm-hmm. no filtering, mm-hmm. absolutely no algorithmic promotion. If you see something on your top level feed, it's because it's someone you follow, okay? You can find the garbage and the stuff yeah, if you look hard enough, but it's hard question, to find. Your okay. question is, so the question is, yeah. given that we have alternatives where people claim they have much better engagement, much better experience, and those alternatives don't use the tools that, like uh, algorithmic promotion, isn't potentially part of the problem here to simply say the platform should not be interfering with the flow of content mm. or its ordering. They okay. should do less, not more. Ladies, you want? Sure. Francis, you were. Um, so I, I, I think it's important. Um, so, so most of you, if I sat down with you and said, how has Facebook changed over the last 12 years? Um, you'd say, oh, it's, it's kind of the same product. I mean, like maybe there's videos now. Maybe there's like stories at the top. It hasn't changed very much. In reality, the product is radically different, but it's all behind the curtain. Right, it's on the data. On, on, it's, it's things like algorithms. I always point out to people when the Arab Spring happened, there were no algorithms in the Facebook newsfeed. Right, we forget that. Um, we can have social media that has huge social impacts, but is at a more human scale. So one of the consequences of having, so we might say, like, well, why did we get algorithms? Like, why why did all these platforms like TikTok has almost no social graph? They're like, it's about algorithms. Um, other startups are saying, I want to be the TikTok of X, I want to be the TikTok of audio, I want to be the TikTok of short text, whatever. Or like Threads is kind of TikTok, is that, not kind of, it is very TikTok-y. Because uh, they don't tell you why you get things. So the reason why we saw that shift was when you have 
uh, for-profit companies that need to show that you get more and more growth and more and more engagement and more and more ad views every quarter, um, you begin to say, ooh, your friends and family let my company down because they don't produce enough content for me to keep you there longer and longer. And so they started shifting away from saying, you get enough content uh, from your friends and family to being like, ooh, if we could just get 10% more content in your feed, 30% more, you'd stay on there longer. Like, too many people are hitting the ends of their feeds. And so in the case of Mastodon or Blue Sky is a for I think it's for profit or is it part of a not? It, what's, what's the economic? Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, those companies can do things that are just optimized around their communities because they are open source software. In the case of Pinterest, in the case of Facebook, uh, in the case of uh, Twitter's kind of rolling it back a little bit now. Like they're, they're, they, they're giving people a lot more control over what they see. Um, what, what you end up, uh, people like being online. They like having boredom uh, taken up. And so it's one of these things where as long as people don't know, oh, like when you, if we were going to segment your content and say, what fraction of your content has the unpleasant content for you? Is it coming from your friends and family or is it coming from random stuff? A huge fraction of it is coming from random stuff. If we let people actually get content they consented to, they would get less violence, less incitement, less, less nudity that they didn't ask for. Okay. But well, it'll make less money. So That's the problem. So sort of briefly, because I know you probably have a lot of other questions you want to go to, yeah. our approach will be to say that there isn't any r single feature that is wrong per se, yeah. but it's about understanding the risks that it might cause. So commercial business models that reward attention and keep, want to keep you hooked on the platform for as long as possible, lead to risks. So that's for us is the key thing. And, and, and rather than banning particular features. Um, so I think you know, it's a very relevant factor, but not one that we would say is wrong per se. It's all about how it works and the experience that it gives the user. Like you would that's get, a you very could, brief you could answer. Like dial in mega groups and still have algorithms on Facebook, and it would be just as engaging, just not hey, as... Toxic. We're not going to... We're going to have more yeah. than one yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, so. Thanks so much. Stephen Balkum with the Family Online Safety Institute. Very good to see you. you. Um, Francis... Thank you for bringing up Arturo uh, Bihar, a uh, big fan. How would you say what, you, what he has done is similar but different? Mm. And my second part of my question is, how can we in the United States emulate what's going on in the UK, or for that matter, the eSafety Commission in Australia? How can we get up to speed? Gotcha. Um, so in the case of Arturo, um, I believe we have not framed Arturo's actions with enough significance. So Arturo was inside the company in 20, 2021 when I came forward, when all the media happened. He saw that Facebook was actively mischaracterizing the internal research. He had a 14-year-old daughter who was getting sent naked images by adult men. Um, he had seen that over and over again he had brought concrete data to the executives and had been kind of like, you know, pushed aside. And so he intentionally took the research that he had done. So he had been surveying under 16-year-old children, mostly girls, and asking them questions like, did you receive an unwanted sexual contact in the last seven days? And he took that and many other similar survey questions, wrote them into a very concise, neat email, and he sent it to all the executives. So he committed a, like one of the most patriotic civic acts that I've, I've seen in a long time because he knew that the actions of, that, I, that had been kicked off by like my coming forward were going to cause things to get subpoenaed. And he sent all the executives, and Cheryl Sandberg wrote back. So now she has culpability. And he met with a bunch of the executives. And they told him, don't spread your data internally. Talk about only in the hypothetical. right? And because there was an active cover-up, and he was willing to talk to the government, so he, he prepped everything for the government, and then he talked to the government. And that is an amazingly, amazingly courageous act. And I am very, very proud of him, and I'm very grateful for what he did. Okay, in here, yeah, in here yeah. middle, yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Troy. I'm a connectivity entrepreneur. Um, I'm interested in the uh, the global effects of national legislation yeah. in more mm -hmm. advanced Great countries Great like EU, UK. Um, uh, to what extent um, do you think about the examples you're setting? Is there any kind of implicit advocacy or hopes that other countries sort of follow your lead? Because um, it is a global competitive internet governance space with very varying views. So to what extent should national legislation kind of have the rest of the world in mind? Mm. That's a great, a great question. And um, 
Look, we're not the only ones doing this in the UK. Um, uh, the European Union's also introduced the Digital Services Act. There are countries like Australia that have had stuff going for a while. Actually, they're the only ones that have had stuff going for a while. Um, Brazil, South Africa, Canada, um, South S Korea, Singapore. Uh, Singapore. Um, so um, there is a real risk here that we end up with huge complexity, frankly, that doesn't go far enough and something that's very fragmented and piecemeal. We're very well aware of that at Ofcom. We've got a long tradition of international collaboration, including on spectrum and telecoms matters uh, with the FCC. So we've set up a global network of safety regulators, including most of the countries I just mentioned. We also have um, a, a special group on age assurance because there are some jurisdictions that are interested in that and not in the wider piece. Um, we've also uh, been doing a lot of work using things like UN protocols on um, fundamental rights as a starting point for how we're thinking about these things, so we're not just thinking about the British legal context. There's work that's being led uh, under the umbrella of the World Economic Forum so that, for example, we think about risk assessments, which a lot of the new legislative approaches have in, in there somewhere so that we can have consistency where possible. So I hope that over the coming years, there will be sets of voluntary and statutory, a mix really, of international standards here that different countries can adopt. In the UK, we're very, very cognizant of the fact that because we have the English language and we also have an incredibly diverse country with people from so many other backgrounds, faiths, languages in the United Kingdom, that a lot of what we do will potentially set standards elsewhere, mm -hmm. including in countries where there isn't the same commitment to democratic uh, values. So things like you know, just making sure that we truly empower freedom of speech, actually, and make sure that minorities and people who may not have a voice are able to use the internet, and that there's nothing we do that undercuts that. For example, by clamping down on anonymity, which is sometimes suggested in some circles. We're, we're very cognizant of that responsibility that we, we may have uh, because we are likely, well, we kind of hope to be influential beyond our boundaries. But it's a, it's a really good question. And it, you know, it's probably going to look quite complicated for a bit, to be honest, as things start to shake out. Let me, let me step out of the moderator role and hmm. the advocate role for a second as a recovering regulator. Mm. <laughs> I'll um, be there one day. Yes. <laughs> um, the United States used to lead the world in thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. But you can't be a leader unless you know where you stand. It's the mm. old where you stand depends on where you sit kind of situation, right? And because of the fact that we have been unable as a federal government to develop concepts for agile oversight of these activities. We are in a situation where we're sitting back and watching the rest of the world make the, the kind of decisions that we used to provide leadership on. God bless Melanie Dawes oh, thank you very for much. her leadership. <laughs> okay? I think you should really congratulate our parliament. And, but. And, and, but, but the fact of the matter is that because of the fact that we've been, our government has been convinced not to act, we're in this situation. I'm sorry. I, I, I was going to say, like, the, the part of why we've gone here, like, to answer your question earlier, like, how do we actually, do, how do we actually move forward is uh, if you look at who spent money where and how much, uh, Facebook, Google, they spent a huge amount of money in the U.S. talking to not just Congress, not just their aides, but to people like, you know, the head of the American Psychological Association, and painting a very, very narrow portrait of what could be done. And I think part of the reason why the DSA passed first was uh, every single lobbyist for Facebook speaks English. Only a couple speak Polish. Maybe one speaks Latvian, right? Like they're, and, and the same places were getting the least protected experience on Facebook, right? Like there's very, very few safety systems in many of the languages that are spoken in Europe. And so you, the EU set the precedent that there are ways to solve these problems not with content, that risk assessments are flexible, you know, they can solve a lot of different problems. The EU built on that by saying, hey, we have a long history of being one of the most effective, plays well with others, regulators. Like, I worked with your competition's market authority, and I was amazed at how, like, they throw conferences for other people's regulators because they're like, building those connections matter. And so I think I'm so glad that the European, uh, that, not the European, the UK has stepped in and said, hey, we want to build on that tradition 
and now show you what a mature regulator can do and how we can build on that scaffold in a collaborative way mm -hmm. because not all countries can afford those resources. No, absolutely. And, and just, just, to, just to say, I mean, the UK isn't the only, we really aren't the only ones, and the, the European Union Digital Services Act is, is a very close cousin of our Online Safety Act. And although we're no longer a member of the European Union, and there are some differences in the two regimes, they're both fundamentally about systems and processes, mm -hmm. risk assessment, and appropriate mitigation. So that collaboration between the UK and the EU is going to be a very, it's particularly important for us across the English Channel. But you have a three-year so, head start. So, and, 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 oh, and, yeah. and, 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 and a regulatory yeah. structure that they have yet to develop. <laughs> but 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 let me close on a high note. Sure. Thank these leaders for being here and go back to the point I was making at the outset that this is yeah. an historic moment. We are at a point where things are truly starting to change mm -hmm. and it's because of people like this. Can I leave one last more go positive for it. thing? So I want to just a light a fire under everyone in the room, <clears throat> everyone on the call. We need to ask what kind of laws we want to pass, right? The question is, do we want to pass something moderate, practical, sensible sooner, or do we want to wait for the harms to build and we pass emotional extreme laws later? And I think we're starting to see this with kids. There's a couple of states that have done things like say, kids shouldn't have privacy online. That's an emotional extreme approach. So ask yourselves, do we want to act now, soon, on something sensible and moderate? Or do we want to let emotions drive us in the future? So. Dame Melanie Dawes, Francis Hogan, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.